Dead America, The Second Month, Seattle Rebuild, Part 5 Written by Derek Slayton Narrated by Aaron Smith Chapter 1 Seattle Rebuild, Day 5 Atticus Windward strolled up the road as the sun slowly came up over the horizon. A light rain pitter pattered on the brim of his cowboy hat, the weather keeping the road mostly clear of people. He didn't much care about the wetness, his cowboy boots keeping his feet dry as he went for his walk. His polished silver six-shooter clanged a bit in its holster with every step, as if he were a cowboy headed to an old western showdown. The low sun cast a long shadow on him, his silhouette stretching halfway across the street, making his six-foot frame look even more menacing. The few people awake and out in the poor weather stared at the dark-skinned cowboy with something akin to awe as he strutted his large frame down the street, unaffected by anything around him. He was all business as he walked to the stadium, where a large line-up of people already stood outside, about thirty deep. He reached the back of the line and stood there, staring down a balding head on a white guy in front of him. The man glanced back over his shoulder, and his eyes went wide at the sheer size of the man behind him, facing front again quickly. Atticus smirked to himself and shook his head, shifting his weight to one hip to patiently wait in the line. After several minutes of waiting, the line moved slowly. The short man looked back again, and then faced front again just as quickly, clasping his hands in front of him. You don't have to keep stealing glances, Atticus drawled in his deep, commanding voice. Feel free to look me up and down. Just don't be offended when I tell you that you're not my type. The shorter man blinked in surprise as he turned around, his mouth opening and closing with clear nervousness. Oh, no, he stammered, shaking his head back and forth. It's nothing sexual like that. It's just... Oh. He choked off his words. Um. Atticus burst out laughing, and the man's shoulders seemed to relax a bit. It's okay, Atticus assured him with a clap on the shoulder. I'm just having a little fun. Getting a good laugh going helps warm the soul, especially on a dreary morning like this. The bald man joined in a bit, and then took a deep breath. All right, you got me with that one he finally said. I didn't mean anything bad by the looks, it's just... He hesitated, scrunching up his nose as if to find the right words. That a six-foot-tall black cowboy looks out of place in the Pacific Northwest, Atticus said. The man swallowed hard and nodded. Not sure I would phrase it that way, but pretty accurate, he agreed. Don't worry, I get that a lot, Atticus assured him. The bald man offered a smile and extended his hand. I'm Jim, he said. Atticus, the cowboy replied, and then shook firmly. It's a pleasure to meet you, Jim said politely. Likewise, Atticus replied. So, you're a local? Jim tilted his head back and forth. Kind of, he said slowly. I'm from a little town called Cleallum, about a hundred miles to the east of here. When the military rolled through a couple weeks back, they found a group of us who were riding the storm out in the local church. They took us along for the ride to Seattle. Taking refuge in a church, Atticus said, cocking a brow. You a religious man, Jim? The bald man raised his palms. Hell no, he said. Who can be with everything that's going on? However, I am eternally grateful for those who were back in the early 1900s, because they built a fortress for their house of worship. Once we got those doors secured, it took everything the military had just to get them open so we didn't have any fear of those things getting in. It was almost funny watching some of those young soldiers trying to figure out how to break through that barricade we had set up. Atticus laughed. Gotta take the good times whenever they come, right? He said. Oh, you'd better believe it, Jim agreed. We laughed our asses off for a good hour. The soldiers were less amused. I bet they were, the cowboy agreed. The line continued to move, with the guards at the front of the stadium waving for them to move up. Atticus and Jim made it to the stadium and out of the rain, the former taking his hat off to shake the water from it and let his own bald head get some air. So, what about you? Jim asked, tilting his head. 
How'd you find yourself in this neck of the woods for the apocalypse? Atticus shrugged. I was on a camping and fishing trip to Mount Rainia with my daughter Susie when all of this started, he explained. Not a lot of people out there this time of year, which was fortunate. We spent a good three or four days without seeing anybody other than a group of college kids on the opposite side of the lake where we were camping. They were typical college kids, just having a good time and letting off some steam. He paused, shaking his head. Until one day, all was quiet. We just thought they had left, but then I saw one of the girls, sitting out by the fire all alone. My instincts kicked in and I had a feeling something was wrong, so I went to check it out. Jim's eyes widened. Guessing everything wasn't okay? he asked. No, sir, it was not, Atticus confirmed. This young lady, Evelyn, was sitting by the fire, just crying. Took some coaxing to find out what was wrong. Finally, she told me that her boyfriend and her other friends were all sick. Near death kind of stuff. The shorter man nodded solemnly. How long was it until their situation changed? He asked with a knowing tone. About an hour, Atticus replied. I checked in on them, and they were all passed out, shivering. Just not in good shape. She told me that one of her other friends took the car back into town to get help since they couldn't move them on their own. I managed to get Evelyn to come over to our camp to stay while she waited for her friend to come back. Then it happened. He took a deep breath, but didn't continue for a beat, his eyes glazing over as if he were reliving that day. Jim's brow furrowed in concern, and he reached out to put a hand on the cowboy's arm. This seemed to snap Atticus out of his reverie, and he shook himself back to the present. Don't worry, both Evelyn and Susie are just fine, he said, tapping the old gun at his side. I took care of the business that needed dealing with and kept them safe. They're back at one of the makeshift camps. Jim nodded in approval. Don't know how much it's worth coming from an old, bold stranger, but good job he said firmly. A lot of people say they'll help people in times of need, but you're one of the few who actually did. Just did what I thought was right, Atticus replied with a one smile. Worked for me my entire career. Didn't see any reason to stop now. Before Jim could get another question in, one of the soldiers near the entrance to the field started speaking loudly, prompting everyone to pay attention. Good morning, everybody, he called. Thank you for coming in on such a lovely day. Light chuckles ripped through the crowd of about fifty people or so, and the soldier nodded. Given the conditions and the relatively light turnout, we are going to have you meet with the census takers in some of the skyboxes upstairs, he explained. Shouldn't take too long, so if you all want to follow me, I'll show you where you need to go. The group shuffled towards the stairs, Jim and Atticus moving slowly at the back. Man, walking in a group behind the leader, going to a classroom to answer questions? Jim drawled. I swear this feels like career day at the local high school. Atticus chuckled. Somehow, I don't think you're too far off there, bud, he said. They worked their way to the second level, and the soldier broke them up into groups. The duo stopped as a group was sent in, and then were waved forward to the next room. In here, sir. Please go to the furthest table and take a seat the soldier instructed. You got it, Atticus replied, tipping his hat, and led Jim into a skybox with half a dozen tables set up. Jim found his seat, and Atticus slid into his own across from a young female soldier. She looked young, not much older than twenty. Her blonde hair pulled back into a ponytail. Morning, sir, she said politely. Atticus nodded. Good morning, ma'am, he replied with a nod, removing his hat and placing it on his knee. I promise this will be quick and painless, she said with a smile. He winked at her. I'm going to take you at your word on that, he quipped, and she chuckled as she shuffled around some papers, getting a fresh one set up on a clipboard. May I have your full name, please? she asked. He nodded. Of course, he said. It's Atticus Windward. The private smirked and looked up at him. Atticus, huh? she asked. Mother was a literary fan, I take it? She was a librarian, he confirmed with a nod. Very well read and very well spoken. She nodded thoughtfully. Appears to have rubbed off on you, she said. More like I had the southern twang beaten out of me by the book with my namesake in it, 
he joked. They shared a chuckle, and she returned to her paper. So, where are you from, Atticus? she asked, tapping her pencil on the clipboard. East Texas, ma'am, he replied politely. Little town called Rusk. The private cocked her head. Interesting name, she said. Named after Thomas Jefferson Rusk, one of the signers of the Texas Declaration of Independence, Atticus explained. She smiled brightly. Oh, I love historical towns, she said. So much fun learning about the history, seeing all the sights. He chuckled. Well, there really wasn't a whole lot of sights to be seen, if I'm being honest, he admitted. We had a statue, and half the roads in town were named after him, but that's about it. Still better than my hometown back in Arkansas, that I'm pretty confident was named after someone pulled a random word out of a hat, she said. They shared a laugh, and one of the soldiers in the middle of the room cleared his throat loudly, shooting a glare at the blonde soldier. She withered under his gaze, blushing and mouthing a quick, Sorry. My apologies, Atticus said quietly. I didn't mean to get you in trouble there. She waved him off. Don't worry about him, she said flippantly. He's just cranky now that coffee is on a half a cup ration for us run-of-the-mill cannon fodder. That's going to take some getting used to, Atticus said, shaking his head. Tell me about it, she agreed with an emphatic nod. I usually need a thermos full just to keep my eyes open past noon, she exaggerated, blinking as if she was still asleep. I will keep my eyes out for a rogue cup, Atticus offered with a smile. She nodded. I appreciate that, she said. Okay, back to this census. She ran her finger down the sheet. Next question is occupation. Texas Ranger, Atticus replied. She looked up at him, her eyes widening with excitement. Texas Ranger? Really? she asked. What did you do for them? I spent the better part of the last twenty years tracking down wanted felons, he explained. If you were one of Texas's most wanted, chances are your file would come across my desk. She leaned forward, her face lit up and curious. Like you tracked people down, but didn't know where they were, right? She asked, then shook her head violently, raising a hand clearly a little flustered. I'm sorry, not phrasing that particularly well. You had to, like, follow clues and whatnot to find them. He cracked an amused smile. Yes, ma'am, he said. Somebody would bust out of jail or escape from a bad crime scene, and they would bring me in. I started at the scene, worked the clues, and more often than not, I would find whoever I was tasked with finding. And you were doing this when all of this started? The private asked, a big smile on her face. I went into semi-retirement about three months ago, he explained, wanting to spend a little more time with my daughter. Three months? Close enough, she said, scribbling on her paper. She got up from her desk, gripping the clipboard tightly, and motioned for him to stay put. Okay, I'm sorry, but I will be right back. He raised an eyebrow, but complied as she excitedly darted over to the soldier who had scolded her earlier. They talked for a few moments before the two of them came back over. Good morning, mister, the soldier trailed off, then glanced at the paper. Windward. Atticus will be fine, the cowboy corrected him. Okay, Atticus, the soldier replied with a smile. Would you please come with me? The cowboy's brow furrowed. Is something wrong? he asked. Absolutely not, the soldier said quickly. There are just a couple of people I would like you to meet. Please, time is of the essence. Atticus contemplated for a moment before standing up and putting on his hat. There would be no real point in arguing or not following in the directions. He tipped his hat towards the young private. Been a pleasure, ma'am, he said. You have a good day. She grinned at him as she took her seat. You too, Atticus, she said. As he followed the soldier out, Jim glanced up at him from his own desk. You okay? he asked. Getting called to the principal's office, apparently, Atticus joked with a sheepish shrug. Jim chuckled. Good luck, he called. The soldier led Atticus from the room and down the hallway towards several doors. He tapped a communicator on his chest. Noah, I have a potential for the Hayden situation, he said quickly. Take them to conference room 412, a man replied from the speaker likely whoever this Noah was. We'll be there soon. Copy that, the soldier replied. You're going to tell me what's going on? Atticus asked, speeding up a bit so he was in stride with the soldier. The man shook his head. That's above my pay grade, sir, he said stiffly. 
He opened a door, revealing a large conference table with the lights on, showing maps and other drawings and lists adorning the walls. Noah and the others will be with you in a few moments, the soldier said. Would you like anything in the meantime? Coffee? Breakfast? Atticus nodded slowly. Wouldn't mind a bit of both, actually, he said. Yes, sir, the soldier replied. Please have a seat, and I'll be right back with that. Atticus nodded and looked around as the door clicked shut behind him. He walked around the room, looking at the maps and the various notes written all over the whiteboards. There were stats for troop strength, ammunition, food counts, and various supply lists. His brow furrowed as he went over the numbers. Interesting, he murmured. Very interesting. Chapter Two Atticus sat at the conference table, his hat resting beside him. He studied the wall ahead of him, trying to piece together the story that the information told. After several minutes the door opened, and it was the soldier who had brought him in. He set down a tray and offered a soft smile. Sir, I got you the biggest cup of coffee I could find, he said. I do apologize, because I couldn't find anything to doctor it up with. Atticus chuckled and shook his head. Don't worry, soldier. I like my coffee like I like my reflection, he said with a smirk. Tall, hot, and black. The soldier chuckled and motioned to a little piece of prepackaged pastries. Breakfast is a bit slim, too, he said, an apologetic look in his eyes. Just some of these prepackaged Danish things. The good news is, I'm pretty sure they never expire. Of course. The bad news is, they are going to taste like they never expire, Atticus quipped. Afraid so, sir, the soldier said, wrinkling his nose. Beggars can't be choosers, though, Atticus said with a smile. Thank you. Of course, sir, the soldier said and turned towards the door. It opened as if on cue, and three men entered. The soldier held out the clipboard with Atticus's information on it, and a corporal took it, scanning down the paper. Thank you, soldier. We'll take it from here, he said. The soldier nodded and left shutting the door behind him. Atticus stayed seated, tearing open a pastry package and taking a large bite before washing it down with some bitter coffee. Atticus Windward, the corporal said as he read the clipboard. The cowboy swallowed his mouthful. Present, he quipped. I'm Corporal Gad, the soldier said. This is Clint and Noah. He motioned to the large man and the slight gentleman in a crisp suit next to him. Gentlemen, Atticus greeted with a nod, sneaking another mouthful of pastry as Gad examined the sheet. Says here you are a Texas Ranger with a knack for tracking people down, the corporal said. Atticus shrugged. Been accused of worse in my time, he drawled around stale, flaky dome. So you're a bounty hunter? Clint asked, crossing his arms. State-sponsored one the cowboy corrected, in a manner of speaking. Gad nodded. I can work with that, he said. I'm sure you can, Atticus drawled, leaning back in his seat. Question is, can I work with you? I certainly hope so, Noah said, clasping his hands around a folder in front of him. Atticus sighed. All right, boys, lay it on me, he said. What can I do for you? Clint and Gad exchanged a look and then a nod, turning back to him. We have an outpost in Hayden, Idaho, Clint began, just to the east of Spokane. It's an important spot for us because it's the first bit of civilization the trains hit once they leave Helena, Montana. Without boring you with a lot of details, we're bringing in goods from the east to help shore up our supplies here. Gad nodded, leaning against the table. We received word overnight that one of our transports was hit just before reaching town, he explained. About a thousand pounds of food was stolen and a man was killed. We would like your help in tracking down those responsible. Atticus took a long sip of coffee, setting the cup down and contemplating for a moment before speaking. You have the entire U.S. military at your disposal, he said slowly. Special forces, military police. Why would you need me? For starters, our military is bogged down with any number of a few hundred different tasks at the moment, Gad said with a sigh. So we're short-handed. Atticus shook his head. Doesn't make sense, he said. Are you really looking me in the eye and telling me that you can't spare a single man for this job? Not one single soldier? Clint took a deep breath. There is another reason, 
he said. Clint, Gat warned, his voice defensive. The other man shrugged and crossed his arms. Either we tell him, or he's not going to help us, he argued. The corporal clenched his jaw. Fine, he muttered, shaking his head in frustration. Before the apocalypse, this region of the country was a hotbed for militia activity, Clint explained. We haven't heard a lot from these groups since we've been here, but one of our fears is that they're still out there. If, and that's a big if, one of these groups is responsible for the attack, the last thing we can risk is having the military involved in a retaliatory attack. He took a deep breath and raised his chin. Because, to be quite frank, we are in no condition to get into a conflict with any group, well organized or not. Hell, our troops are having a devil of a time just clearing out zombies in the suburbs, thanks to the lack of bullets. A big enough militia could cause some major damage and risk everything we've done here. Atticus nodded slowly. And sending in a civilian gives you plausible deniability, he said. At least, you hope it does. I'll be honest, Clint said with a sigh. We're grasping at straws on about twenty different fronts now. If sending a civilian to do this reduces the risk of retaliation even one percent, it's worth it. We need every advantage we can get right now, no matter how slight. Atticus nodded slowly. Hypothetically, what would you need me to do? he asked. Get to Hayden and assess the situation, Gad replied. Track down those responsible and handle it as you see fit. Atticus cocked a brow. Even if it's just a report back to you? he asked. We're not asking you to be an assassin, Clint said firmly. If a couple of people hiding in the woods did this, please feel free to put the fear of God into them. If it's something bigger, just use your judgment. We'll live with whatever you do. Atticus nodded slowly. Fair enough, he said. However, last time I checked, Idaho is a bit of a haul. How do you propose getting me there? We will have a chopper ready to take off in an hour, Clint said. Gad blinked at him. A chopper? he blurted. You opposed to me getting the VIP treatment? Atticus challenged, jutting out his chin. Not at all, Gad gushed, waving his hands in front of his face. It's just... Our fuel situation makes our ammunition situation look stellar, Noah finished easily. Both the other men glared at him, eyebrows hitting the ceiling in exasperated looks. What? Noah asked haughtily. You're telling him everything anyway. I'm just trying to speed things along. Clint sighed. So, yeah, he said with a grunt. We'll have an on-site contact for you. They'll be able to take you wherever you need to go, get you whatever you need. Has anybody been to the site? Atticus asked. Clint shook his head. Not if the orders were followed, he said. We didn't want to contaminate the scene. So, any questions? Gad asked. Atticus finished off the pastry he'd been chewing and swiped his hands together to rid himself of flaky bits. Yeah, just one, he said, and took a long sip of coffee before smacking his lips together. What's in it for me? Gad and Clint shared a pointed look. The satisfaction of knowing you're helping out your country in a time of great need? Gad asked hesitantly. Atticus shrugged, shaking his head. Afraid I'm going to need more than that, he drawled. Well, it was worth a shot, the corporal muttered. What would you like? Clint asked. Well, based on what I'm seeing on the walls here, and in the camp as a whole, there's some rationing on the horizon, Atticus began. Gad nodded. Today, as a matter of fact, he said, we're going to be handing out ration tickets this morning. Noah clucked his tongue. He's good, he murmured. How long do you think this job will take? Atticus asked. Three days, Clint replied easily, and I can authorize triple rations for every day you're out. Five a day, Atticus said, then pointed at him. And you pay for five days even if it only takes me one. Clint glanced at the other two, and they both nodded back at him. Deal, he said. What else? I have a ten-year-old daughter and a young babysitter that looks after her, Atticus explained. I want them moved to the front of the line for housing. There are a lot of rough-looking characters in the camps, and I don't feel comfortable leaving them alone. Bring them with you when you come to catch your ride, Noah piped up. I'll take care of their housing personally. Atticus smiled at him. Thank you, he said, 
inclining his head in his direction. So, we have a deal? Clint asked tentatively. Atticus held up a finger. One more thing, he said. Mister, we do need your help, Gad said with an exasperated sigh. But there's a limit on how much we can give you. Don't worry, I'm not asking you to give up any resources on this one, Atticus assured him, raising his palms. Once I do this mission for you, I want free reign to take whatever jobs I want outside of the perimeter. Clint and Gad exchanged a confused look, the former shaking his head and turning back to the cowboy. We're already sending out groups to loot surrounding towns of food and supplies, Clint said slowly. So not sure if it's going to do you that much good to have that perk. That's where you're wrong, Atticus replied. I've spent twenty years hunting people down. I figure it won't be that hard to use those skills to hunt things down as well. People who made it here had to leave everything behind. I figure I can make extra rations finding anything they want. Family heirlooms, prize possession, something they've always wanted but never had money for. Whatever it is, they pay me and I track it down. Noah nodded thoughtfully. Oh, I like that idea, he said. Sometimes finding stuff is hard. I told you I'm working on it, Clint hissed, and the other two men had a laugh at his expense. Before Atticus could ask what they were talking about, Clint turned back to him. All right, I'm okay with that so long as you're willing to take some jobs for me occasionally. Atticus shrugged. You got the rations, I got the skills, he said. Okay, we're good, Clint replied with a nod. The cowboy stood and shook hands all around. Clint and I have about a hundred other things to deal with, Gat said apologetically. Noah here will handle your departure. It's been a pleasure, gentlemen, Atticus said, and the two men left. Noah raised his chin. What kind of loadout would you like? he asked. Atticus blinked down at him. Pardon? he asked. Loadout, Noah repeated. Weapons? I have a forty-four magnum and a nine millimeter, so some ammo for those would be nice, Atticus admitted. Also, I wouldn't turn down a shotgun if you have one. Noah nodded. Double barrel, pump action, or combat? he asked, scribbling away on his notepad. Pump action will be fine, Atticus said. Sometimes just racking a shell is enough to get somebody to do what you need them to do. Noah nodded again. I will be out front in an hour with everything you need, he promised. Atticus grinned and clapped him on the shoulder. Thank you, sir, he said. He left the room and headed down the hallway of the stadium, shoulders back and head held high as a smile grew on his face. He'd started the day in line in the rain, but as he put his hat on his head, he realized he was in business now. Chapter 3 Atticus strolled through the camp that was set up in a large shopping mall. Most people were still milling about, groggy from another bad night of sleep. A few of the people nodded at him as he walked by, and he responded in kind. He didn't know any of their names, but they'd seen each other for days now. He made his way to the back of the mall, a small jewellery boutique in the centre of the hallway. He stood at the glass, seeing his daughter Susie and Evelyn sitting against the counter, the babysitter reading a book to his young daughter. He watched them for a time, Evelyn so sweetly caring for his little girl. He'd rescued the young woman on day zero, and she'd been with him ever since. She happily took care of Susie while he was away, and was one of the only people he trusted in the world anymore. Good morning, girls, he finally said, knocking on the display case. Susie let out a squeal and leapt to her feet, running through the open door of the boutique and pouncing on him. Daddy! she cried. Atticus picked her up and swung her around in a big bear hug. How's my girl this morning? he asked. I'm hungry, she declared. Hungry? he asked. I'm sorry, Evelyn gushed as she exited the boutique. I was waiting on the weather to break a bit before trying to go to the food line. It's okay, Atticus replied with a grin. You're not going to have to worry about that today. Her eyes lit up. We have a place to live? she asked excitedly. Yes, we do, he replied. Susie whooped squeezing his neck tightly. When do we move in? Evelyn asked, bouncing on the balls of her feet. Right now, he replied. So let's get your things together. 
He set Susie down and the girls rushed into the store. He followed and helped Evelyn stack some bags on the counter as Susie went over to her corner. The babysitter lowered her voice once the young girl was out of earshot. How did you manage to do that? she asked quietly. I didn't think we'd have a place for another week or two. I sorta of took a job, he replied. She cocked her head, brow furrowing with concern. What kind of job? she asked warily. A job that's going to provide us with safety and security, he replied, raising a hand. But it means I have to leave for a few days. Would you mind? Of course, Evelyn cut in immediately, shaking her head. I wouldn't mind watching Susie at all. You've done so much for me, and I adore her. Don't worry about a thing. Thank you, he said with a warm smile. Evelyn nodded as Susie approached, her bag overflowing with stuff. I'm all ready, she huffed. Let me help you out there, little miss, Evelyn said with a laugh as she rearranged the contents a bit so that they could zip the bag shut. Atticus watched and his heart clenched a bit. Even though Susie's mother was gone, he was happy that she had a woman looking out for her. He couldn't help but feel a bit bad for Evelyn, who'd had her whole life ahead of her when the apocalypse hit. Now she was a nanny in a military camp. He took a deep breath and schooled his expression as they turned around, handing over the last bag. Are we ready? he asked as he slung it over his shoulder. They both nodded, and he grinned, waving for them to follow. Then let's go! The three of them walked hand in hand, with Susie in the middle, skipping with excitement as they headed out of the mall to the street. The rain had cleared up, but it was still cold out, but Susie didn't seem to mind as she kept her blood pumping from the skipping. When they reached the stadium, Attica spotted Noah standing outside next to a sedan. Ah, this must be your daughter, Noah said with a warm smile. I'm Susie, she exclaimed, practically vibrating with excitement. You are just a little firecracker, aren't you? Noah asked with a chuckle. Yes, I am, she declared, raising her chin proudly. Evelyn laughed and extended her hand to shake. Hi, I'm Evelyn, she said. Nice to meet you, Noah replied and shook. So, I pulled a few strings and have you in a suite in the hotel just across the street from the stadium. There's only one king bed in the room, but there's a couch and a living room, and a small kitchen. I hope that's okay for you. Atticus nodded thankfully. It's a huge improvement from where we've been staying, he said. Thank you, so much. If the ladies would like to follow my friend here, Noah said, stepping aside and motioning to a nearby soldier. He will take them to the room so they can get settled. And food? Atticus asked. Noah nodded. I have arranged for a meal to be brought up to them so they don't have to worry about standing in line while they get settled. Atticus nodded slowly. Going above and beyond, I like that, he said, and then got down on one knee to face his daughter. Baby, I have to go to work now, he said gently. Okay, Daddy, Susie said, throwing her arms around his neck. I'll miss you. She pouted and buried her face into his neck. He rubbed her back in slow circles. I'll miss you too, baby girl. But you and Miss Evelyn are going to have so much fun reading stories and exploring our new house. She gasped with excitement, her sadness forgotten, and jumped up and down, jostling her father in the process. Yes, she squealed. Go on with Miss Evelyn, he said, and gave her one last squeeze before letting her go. Susie took her babysitter's hand, who turned and gave him a wave and a warm smile before heading off with the soldier. Once they were out of view, Atticus straightened his shoulders, his demeanor changing from sweet father to Texas Ranger. We ready to do this? he asked, all business. Noah opened the back seat of the sedan and motioned for him to enter. Hop in, and I'll brief you on the way, he said. Atticus nodded and slid into the seat. Noah followed him in, closing the door, and addressed the soldier in the driver's seat. Northern helipad, Noah instructed. Yes, sir, the soldier replied. As he pulled away from the stadium, Noah handed Atticus a folder full of papers. This is every bit of info I could dig up, Noah explained as the cowboy slowly flipped through the contents. Managed to get some satellite images of the region. They're a couple of weeks old, but at least you'll have an idea of the landscape. Atticus cocked a brow. Couple weeks old? he asked dryly. Yeah, they pulled them from the Spokane operation, Noah explained. The cowboy nodded. All right. I can work with that, he said. 
Fuel for the helicopter was coming up a bit short, so to be safe, we are going to have to land in East Spokane, Noah said. I'm having your contacts meet you there in a high-rail vehicle to take you back to Hayden. Atticus cocked his head. Who am I meeting? he asked. Corporal Parker will be your military liaison, Noah replied. I don't know much about him, but the captain in that region speaks very highly of him. I don't have any way of verifying that, but I'd like to think the captain understands the severity of the situation and is sending someone competent. Atticus chuckled. Not dealt with many higher-ups in your time, have you? he drawled. More than my fair share, unfortunately, Noah replied, with no trace of humor on his face. But working with General Stevens, Corporal Gadd, and Clint has given me a bit of hope that we have the right people in charge. Atticus nodded slowly, a newfound appreciation for the situation. That's good to know, he said. Now, Corporal Parker isn't going to be your only contact, Noah continued, running his finger down one of the pages of his clipboard. A man named Rick will also be joining you. He was the engineer of the train that got hit. He's been around trains his whole life, so if you have questions about them or the attack, he's your man. You do good work, Noah, Atticus said with a smile. The man in the suit shrugged. Just trying my best, he said. Somebody has to, right? Atticus nodded. That they do, he agreed. The car stopped, and the cowboy looked out at the helipad, a chopper warming up in the center. We're here, sir, the driver said. The two men got out of the car and Noah stopped at the trunk as it popped open. He pulled out a duffel bag and held it out. Here you go, he said. You have ammo, rations, and a pump-action shotgun. It's a Super Center special, so don't expect anything top of the line, but it should get the job done. Atticus nodded and held out his hand. I appreciate everything, he said sincerely as they shook. See you in a few days. Noah nodded in response and stepped back as Atticus slapped his hand on top of his hat to keep it from blowing off as he turned towards the chopper. He clambered inside and watched as the ground fell away and the city came into full view. He took a moment to admire how pretty it was as they flew out of the downtown area and then opened up the folder to study his mission at hand. Chapter 4 we're a couple of minutes out, sir, the pilot said. Atticus gave him a thumbs up as he put his papers and maps back in the folder. He looked out over Spokane as they flew over. A few thousand troops were in the streets with barricades set up along the main rail route. It was heavily fortified, with several men at every intersection. What's with the barricades? Atticus asked. Most of the resources were pushed onto the Seattle front, the pilot replied. A lot of the buildings were cleared out in Spokane but not in all of the surrounding areas. It's just a precaution to make sure the rail line doesn't get taken out. Atticus sighed, shaking his head. This stuff is never-ending, isn't it? he asked. Yes, sir, the pilot replied. I saw so many towns like this when I was being brought in for the assault. Where did you come in from? Atticus asked. The pilot took a deep breath. Kansas, sir, he replied. My unit retreated there in the first days of this. I wasn't here for Spokane, but they brought me here to run specialists from Helena to Spokane to help shore it up. Rode the rails from Kansas up here, and it was eye-opening. Every place we passed through looked like this. Atticus shook his head, pursing his lips. Think we're ever going to get everything cleared out? he asked. Not in my lifetime, sir, the pilot replied with a sigh. Not in my lifetime. Good to see you're an optimist, Atticus replied dryly. The pilot smirked. Hey now, I said not in my lifetime, not never, he quipped. That's optimistic, in a way. The men shared a chuckle. All right, I'll give you that one, Atticus agreed. The chopper landed, and Atticus offered him a fist bump before grabbing his gear and jumping down into the landing zone. He walked away as the vehicle lifted back off immediately. People stood in the distance, with a lone building about fifty yards away. Atticus headed towards it, holding his folder tightly to make sure he didn't lose any papers. As he approached, two men met him outside, a corporal, whom he assumed was Parker, and a civilian. You must be Atticus, the corporal said. The cowboy nodded. That I am, he said, and held out his hand. As they shook all around, the corporal motioned between him and his partner. I'm Corporal Parker, and this is Rick, he said. Good to meet you. 
Rick said with a nod. Atticus returned it cordially. Likewise, he said. Can I get you anything? Parker asked. Food, coffee. Atticus shook his head. No thanks, just point me to our ride, he replied. We're burning daylight, and I have work to do. Straight to business, I like it, Parker replied with a grin. Right this way. They headed towards a block of railroad tracks containing a high rail truck that connected to the rails, which allowed them to drive on it. Hop on in, and we'll get moving, Parker instructed. Take about an hour to get to the attack site. Atticus hopped in the front passenger seat and Rick squeezed in the back. As they began to move, the cowboy pulled out the satellite image of the area, passing it into the back seat to Rick. There was a spot just to the west of Lake Pondere that was circled. Is this about where the attack took place? Atticus asked, turning sideways to address the man behind him. Rick studied the map for a moment and then nodded. Thereabouts, he replied. Is it exact? Atticus asked. Rick tilted his head back and forth. It's just north of a tiny little town called Athol, he explained. There's a town there? the cowboy asked, brow furrowing. If you can call it that, Parker put in. More like a stop sign that people built some houses around, a few hundred people at most. Atticus took the satellite image back, staring over the top of the lake that lined up almost perfectly with the town. Is there a magnifying glass in here? he asked. The corporal shook his head. I don't believe so, he said. Check the glove box, Rick countered, leaning forward from the back to point. There's not a magnifying glass, but one of the guys who had this truck before us was a bit on the blind side. Atticus opened it and dug around, finding a set of thick black-rimmed glasses with inch-thick lenses. He put them on and then immediately ripped them off as his stomach lurched with nausea. Pretty sure I can see through time with these things, he gasped, shaking his head. Rick laughed. Told you. Dude was blind as hell, he said. Don't see why that would be a problem for someone in control of a hundred tons of moving steel, Atticus muttered, and held one of the lenses over the area of the image he wanted to magnify. He honed in on Athol, seeing a road coming out to the east towards the lake, and raked his eyes over it, nodding. Find something? Parker asked, side-glancing him from the driver's seat. Potential escape route, Atticus said. Escape to where? the corporal asked, brow furrowing. There's nothing up there. The cowboy shrugged. Well, if they took a thousand pounds of food, chances are they weren't carrying it out unless they had a small army, he said. Wish I could tell you how many there were, Rick lamented. But all I heard were a couple of shots and a single guy with an assault rifle in my face. Atticus shook his head. It's all good, he said, and continued to use the glasses to scan the lake area, intently focused. What are you looking for now? Rick asked. I'll know it when I see it, Atticus replied distantly. The other two men shared a shrug, and Rick quieted down as the cowboy worked. He slowly scanned the coastline of the lake and then finally nodded. Got him, he said. Parker did a double take. How? he blurted. I can't imagine those are recent images. Don't need to be, Atticus replied, and held up the map to show what he was looking at using his fingers to trace his theory. They hit the train just north of Athol, which has a road cutting straight to the east, dead ending at some big dark area at the lake. My guess is that it's a commercial district. Nobody is going to be stupid enough to put a camp there, especially after a heist. He grinned. However, about a half mile or so to the east, there are some boat docks and no major roads going to them, so it's a lot easier to conceal and defend. The corporal nodded as he caught on. So they hit the train, load up their haul on boats, and head back to their camp, he asked. I mean, it's what I would do, Atticus replied with a shrug. You can hide the vehicle at the commercial area, and if anybody comes by, they'll assume it's leftover from before. Hiding in plain sight. A little bit of paddling, and you're at a remote, relatively safe spot. Parker pursed his lips. So, how do you want to play it, he asked. Let's get to the attack site, Atticus replied. I may know where they are, but I'd like to have some idea of what I'm walking into. The corporal nodded. We'll be there within the hour, he replied. All right, Atticus replied. If something comes up, just give me a nudge. He leaned back, putting his hat over his eyes and crossed his arms. The other men remained quiet, not disturbing him as they drove.
Chapter 5 The high-rail truck pulled up to a stop in a mid-sized town, with dozens of soldiers moving about. Atticus was a little confused. Thought you said Athel was a tiny one-stop sign town, he asked, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. This is Hayden, the corporal replied. We cleared it out on the way to Spokane and have kept it as a hub between Seattle and Helena. Athel is about fifteen miles up the rail. Atticus nodded slowly, stifling a yawn. Okay, but why are we stopped? he asked. Because I want to take precautions, Parker explained. These guys hit a train, so I want to make sure if they try anything, they're going to get a full response. He rolled down his window, motioning for a group of soldiers to come over to the truck. Atticus shook his head. We don't need their help, he insisted. How can you be so sure? the corporal challenged, a hard edge to his tone. Because it's one of two things, Atticus explained. Either a small community of survivors hit the train, in which case they aren't going to bother with the three of us. Or it's a small band of assailants, in which case we can handle them. Parker raised his chin. Still, I would like to be certain of our safety, he replied. And I'm going to overrule you, Atticus shot back. The corporal blinked at him. Excuse me? he demanded. More people means more opportunity to contaminate my crime scene, Atticus explained, not bothered by Parker's tone one bit. Not to mention that the entire reason I'm out here is because your higher-ups don't want to risk a full-scale war with whoever is out there. If they spot the three of us, they're not going to think anything of it. If they spot an entire squad, they might think they have to strike. Next thing you know, the situation is out of control. Parker sat there for a moment in stunned silence, and then his expression turned contemplative, and he finally nodded in agreement. Just letting you know now that if you get me killed, I'm going to haunt your ass in the afterlife, he finally said. Atticus chuckled. Fair enough, he said. Parker leaned out the window, waving off the soldiers that approached, and they saluted him and turned away. All right, here goes nothing, the corporal muttered and put the high-rail truck back in drive. Once they were clear of town, they didn't speak, Atticus keeping a close eye on the tree line on either side of the tracks. He wasn't expecting an attack, but knew that it was smarter to assume that one could happen. As they approached Athel, he held up a hand to signal Parker to slow down. You want me to stop? the corporal asked. No, just drive slowly, Atticus instructed. Let me get a good look. Parker nodded. Will do, he said, and slowed down to about five miles per hour, slowly rolling through the tiny town. There was no movement on the streets, with only a handful of rotting corpses on the ground. Why are those doors open? Atticus asked, pointing to a cluster of houses with the doors kicked in. I thought it was protocol to secure the building after clearing. It is, Parker replied. My guess is that the same people who hit our train came through here looking for supplies. Atticus nodded. Makes sense, he said quietly, and continued to look around, spotting the main road to the east. A few vehicles remained in the driveways of some of the homes. Once they passed the main road out of town, Atticus rolled his hand in the air. Okay, we're good, he said. Parker sped up and took them to the attack site. He stopped a short ways from a blind turn and Rick pointed out the front windshield. Okay, it happened right here, he said. Atticus blinked at him. Here? he asked, cocking his head. He looked down the tracks at the large blind spot about a mile up. They hit you here, not in the turn. No, sir. They hit us right here, Rick replied solemnly. Atticus jutted out his chin. Let's get out, he said, and got out of the truck. I want you to go where I go and follow my instructions. Parker turned off the vehicle as both men nodded and got out to follow him. They stretched for a moment after having been cooped up for so long, waiting as Atticus surveyed the situation and looked around. Okay, Rick, walk me through the attack, he said, motioning ahead. Start from the moment you came around that bend. The other man nodded. All righty, he said. That's a big bend around the lake, so I kept it pretty slow for safety's sake. Rather be a few minutes behind schedule than derail, you know? Anyway... As soon as I cleared the trees, I could see down the straightaway. What time was it? Atticus asked. Rick tapped his chin. I don't remember, he admitted. 
but the sun was below the horizon, so visibility wasn't great. Got a light on the front of the engine, but doesn't do much besides letting me know what's pretty dang close to me. It's more for others to let them know to get the hell out of my way. And what did you see? Atticus prompted. Rick shook his head. Strangest thing, he replied. I saw bright orange on the side of the tracks, and they quickly ran across them. Like orange streaks? Atticus asked, brow furrowing. Was it a flashlight? Rick shook his head again. No, it sure wasn't, he replied. It was like a constant trail of orange. Once I saw that, I hit the brakes. Where at? the cowboy asked. Rick looked around and then pointed to a spot about thirty yards up towards the bend. Atticus walked off of the tracks and to the edge of the trees, looking around the base and seeing nothing. He stepped a few yards into the trees, looking at the backs of them. He grinned and stepped up to the bark, finding a small piece of reflective material. There was a nail through it, holding it to the tree, and it was only an inch or so big, like they'd tried to clean up after themselves but didn't get everything. Found it, he called, and stepped out from cover as the other two men approached him. Reflective wrap, he said, holding out the piece he'd found. We'd use it when we had a scene out in the country and wanted to give people a heads up. Light hits it, and it glows orange. Based on where this is, it would appear as though they secured it and ran across the tracks to get your attention. The corporal scratched his chin. Question is why, though, he asked. They could have easily barricaded the tracks, put a car on it in Athol. Why resort to cheap theatrics in the hope that Rick here would stop? Because derailing the train would bring too much heat on them, Atticus explained. If they get it to stop, they can take what they want to make a break for it. Derail the train, or try to derail it, and you have the area swarming with troops. Parker nodded thoughtfully. Make sense? he agreed. Atticus looked around, studying the tree line. So, what happened next? he asked. Rick turned towards the tracks, using his hands to mime as he spoke. I slammed on the brakes, stopping before I hit the tape, he explained. Before I had a chance to step out to investigate, I had someone bust in and hold a gun on me. I was on my ass the rest of the time until they were gone. And who else was on the train with you? Atticus asked. Rick shook his head. We had a skeleton crew, he replied. We're not exactly flush with talent these days, so we have two engineers to a train. My partner was sleeping in a makeshift cart in the corner. Other than us, we had one soldier guarding the equipment. Is he the man who got killed? Atticus asked. Rick nodded. Yes, sir, he said solemnly. Only heard a single shot so I have to assume he was taken out before he knew what hit him. Where was he? Atticus asked. In one of the boxcars, Rick replied. Door open? The cowboy asked. Rick nodded. Probably not all the way, but gotta keep it cracked if you want some airflow, he explained. And how long were you stopped? Atticus asked. Whole thing took less than five minutes, Rick said with a heavy sigh. The cowboy cocked a brow. Five minutes? He asked. From the time you hit the brakes until they left? Yes, sir, Rick replied. Atticus pursed his lips, staring at the tracks and doing some calculations in his head. Parker sidled up next to him. What you thinking? he asked softly. Minimum of four guys just for the assault, Atticus murmured. Two for the tape, one guarding Rick and our shooter. His voice raised in volume as he moved, motioning as he explained his process. However... If they moved a thousand pounds in under five minutes, they had some serious muscle. His eyes lit up. Or... He hopped the tracks, hurrying over to the tree line on the other side. He didn't break stride, just walked through the small branches. Several footprints marked the ground, all on top of each other, and Atticus pulled out a bright flashlight to make them really stand out in the dim trees. He motioned for the other two to follow him. About thirty yards into the woods, along a makeshift trail, Atticus looked both ways, spotting branches that had been sawed off and tossed aside. He reached out to touch one of the cut points, bringing his fingers away and rubbing them together. This is a new trail, he murmured, and then kept walking along the trail. About fifty yards past that, he found a clearing, and turned back towards the train to see the tracks were barely visible through the brush. Even in the daylight, they would have been completely concealed here, he said. He walked into the clearing, looking at the ground. Parker and Rick tried to step up, but Atticus held his hand up to get them to stop. He studied the ground, seeing multiple footsteps and tire tracks. 
He walked up about twenty yards, keeping his eyes to the ground as he moved, looking around at the several collections of both kinds of tracks. Tire tracks, Parker said. And a whole lot of footprints, Atticus replied. Three, maybe four vehicles. Heavy duty, given how deep the tracks are. Dozen men at a minimum. This is no small group. Atticus nodded slowly. Based on the tracks, everybody who was here was wearing boots, he explained. Won't know for sure until I find them, though. But pretty safe to say this wasn't the work of a few untrained people. These guys knew exactly what they were doing. The corporal sighed. So what now? he asked. You give me a ride back to Athol, and I borrow one of those vehicles, Atticus replied. Rick shook his head. And then what? he asked. I'm going to track these bastards down, Atticus replied. Hopefully keep the lid on this and prevent something bigger from going down. The other men nodded, and the trio headed back to the truck. Atticus mentally prepared himself, since his day was about to kick into high gear. Chapter 6 Atticus cruised down the road in an older, beat-up truck. It was coated in primer and missing the front bumper, but it was running and getting him where he needed to go. It didn't need to be pretty, plus, with it being older, it was a hell of a lot easier to hotwire. He stopped in the middle of the road, right by a sign that read Lake Ponderay, straight ahead. He drove to the end of the road, parking the truck at the edge of the parking lot and getting out. He gathered his weapons, his forty-four magnum in its holster, his nine-millimeter strapped to his back, and his pump-action shotgun in his hand. He checked to make sure a round was chambered, and then pocketed a few extra shells before walking away. He headed towards the community docks. There were a couple of large buildings, like it was a family destination. A restaurant stood there, as well as a place to buy lake accessories, like floaties and inner tubes. There were several racks for canoes, but they were all empty. As he walked through the parking lot, he looked around at the dozen or so vehicles there, but one thing that really caught his eye was a cluster of trucks pulled up right by the water. He moved closer to investigate and looked into the bed of one of the trucks, finding a small package of pasta that had exploded, sending curly noodles along the ridges of the bottom. So far, I'm right on the money, he thought. Let's see if anybody is home here. He led with his shotgun, walking towards the store. It was locked up tight, and he looked inside, seeing that the store was mostly untouched. As he scanned, his eyes honed in on the snack section, which had been totally cleaned out. He walked towards the restaurant, one of those American grill-type places. The front door was unlocked and swinging with the breeze, and he approached cautiously, poking in slowly. The inside almost looked untouched, like the day the apocalypse began, tables and chairs set up for the lunch rush. He walked back towards the kitchen, seeing that every scrap of food had been carried off to an unknown place. He worked his way back to the pantry, opening the door and immediately slamming it upon coming face to face with about three dozen zombies piled up inside. Ooh, he huffed, shaking his head. That's a hell of a stench. He stood there for a few moments, contemplating, and then headed back outside. He pulled out the satellite image, tracing the coast and finding his circled spot along the southern bank of the lake. All right, let's go see what we can find, he thought, and walked to the waterfront, heading off towards the trees on the southern bank. He managed to find a walking trail with a sign that read Nature Walk 3.5 miles. Well, going to get my exercise in today, he murmured, and strolled along the shady path listening carefully for anything in the distance. As he walked, he discovered a handful of corpses on the ground. Based on their stage of decomposition, he assumed they'd been there for a while. The first ten minutes of his walk was uneventful. It was just a nice nature hike on a cool winter's day. But that changed at the crack of a gunshot in the distance. Atticus darted off of the main path into the trees nearest the water, he hid behind a large tree, gripping his shotgun tightly. He stared ahead, finally spotting three men in fatigues aiming their weapons off into the distance. He followed their line of fire, spotting a zombie shambling through the woods, and watched as one of the men fired, missing the ghoul entirely. Another one of the men mocked him, but they were too far away for Atticus to make out exactly what his words were. He could tell by the tone and reaction that it wasn't a compliment. 
The man doing the insulting stepped up and aimed, also missing, and the first man barked a laugh and teased him right back. Atticus couldn't help but chuckle at the guys as they tried to take down a single zombie. Finally, the third man stepped up, took aim, and managed to take the creature down. The cowboy waited to see what they did next, and was relieved as they turned around to head back the way they came. He took a knee, giving them plenty of time to put distance between them. Well, it's doubtful they're trained military, he thought as he waited, because anybody who went through boot camp should be able to hit that target. Still, though, if they have bullets left, they're going to be dangerous. He gave them a good five minutes to get down the line before breaking cover and continuing on. As he walked down the trail, he looked from side to side, seeing a handful of zombies laying dead on the ground. Not the first time they've been out hunting, he thought. Amazing that even this far out from civilization those things are here. He continued his walk, slowing when he spotted a clearing up ahead. He moved from the trail, taking cover behind some trees, so that he had a view of the area ahead. He pulled out a set of binoculars and scanned the area, seeing a small grouping of houses, no more than ten. They lined along two streets, as if someone had picked up a few blocks of a neighborhood and just dropped it in the middle of the woods. The houses were big, but not overly fancy, nor new. It looked like the place had been there for decades. People walked around, about thirty or forty armed men, but also families, women, and children. People tended to some greenhouses, while others cooked over open flames in the middle of the little settlement. Atticus continued to look, finally spotting some of the crates that were presumably from the train. A couple of them sat beside one of the houses, and some men were unpacking them and delivering goods to the houses. Okay, run through it, he thought, giving himself a pep talk. How do you play this? You tell the military that there's an armed group of this size in the middle of nowhere, and they can bomb them out of existence, women and children included. That's not exactly something you need on your conscience. He studied the community, focusing on the closest of the armed men. On the other side, making a lone man raid against that many armed guys and you'd be kindling for the fire. Then again, they can't shoot worth a damn, so maybe you'll be all right. He chuckled to himself and then shook his head, taking a deep breath. I got to get in there and get a closer look, figure out if they're reasonable people or not. Don't want to be party to a slaughter if I don't have to be. He took in another long, slow breath and let it out slowly. He knew what he had to do. Yeah, great. What could possibly go wrong with this strategy? He shook his head and walked back into the trees, setting his shotgun down barrel first and leaning it up against a large tree so that the trigger was up. Okay, here goes nothing, he muttered. Chapter 7 Atticus emerged from the woods, looking both ways on the small two-lane road that led to the camp. He started walking confidently, like he was there for business. His cowboy hat made him look even taller, like a force of nature. As he approached the camp, a makeshift barricade came into view, made from boxes and other debris on the road. Two armed men stood behind it, just sitting and conversing, not paying him any attention. They were dressed in hunting gear, though they didn't look like stereotypical backwoods hunters. Atticus wanted their attention, so he started whistling a tune as he wandered up the road, which finally got them moving. Both men flailed around for their rifles, clearly flustered and unused to travellers. Atticus stopped and casually raised his palms. Stop, or we'll shoot! One of the guards cried shrilly, finally managing to get his rifle raised. I'm not going anywhere, boys, Atticus drawled. Just looking for a safe place to stay for the night. Bullshit, the other guard snapped. You're one of those government spies coming to, well, coming to do what you spies always do. Yeah, you want to violate our rights, the first guard cried. We ain't going to let you through. Sir, I'm from Texas, Atticus said slowly. Do you really think I'm going to soil my reputation by working for the feds? The two men looked at each other confused, and then turned back towards him, with their weapons aimed even more menacingly. Easy there, boys, Atticus said gently. If there's no room at the inn for me, I can keep on moving up the road. 
Before anyone else could respond, a chorus of gun cocks echoed and a group of five men approached. I wouldn't move if I were you, a loud voice boomed, and a middle-aged man stepped between the guards. He was built with short black hair and held an air of confidence that told Atticus he was some kind of leader here. I'm guessing you're the man to talk to around here, Atticus asked, voice steady. Name's Joshua, the man declared. And yes, I am. Now, you mind telling me what a black cowboy is doing out in the middle of the woods in Idaho? You would have been a strange enough sight to see in these parts before the world ended. But now, it really don't feel right. The name's Atticus, and yeah, I get that a lot, he drawled. As I was telling your friends there, I'm from Texas, but I moved to Hayden about a year back. Joshua rolled his eyes. You moved from Texas to Hayden, he asked, tone deeply sarcastic. Really? My baby girl got into college in Spokane, Atticus explained, thinking quickly on the fly to weave a tall tale. Her mother died years earlier, and I wanted to be close to her for support. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried retiring on a teacher's pension, but I can assure you that it's not enough to afford a place in Spokane. At least not enough to afford a place in a you're-not-going-to-get-robbed neighborhood. Joshua studied him carefully, clearly scanning his face for a tell. But the cowboy was too good. Okay, then, he said warily. What brings you here? As I'm sure you know, the army rolled through my neck of the woods a couple weeks back and blew everything to hell, Atticus replied, waving a hand over his shoulder flippantly. Had my nice little home barricaded. Stockpile of food. Could have stayed there comfortable for months. He wrinkled his nose in mock disgust. But the military does it as it does, and some jagoff with a flamethrower decides he wants a zombie barbecue. Next thing I know, my house is on fire, my food is going up in smoke, and I'm dodging bullets because those dumbasses think I'm a zombie. Only reason I'm standing here is because they couldn't hit the broadside of a barn from point-blank range. Some of the men behind Joshua began to relax with their guns, nodding in agreement, but it was clear the man wasn't buying what the cowboy was selling. But that happened weeks ago, Joshua said, narrowing his eyes. Why are you on my doorstep now? Atticus scoffed. Those army boys weren't content with burning down my house and trying to turn me into Swiss cheese, he explained. They're all about carrying your weight. I've been stuck doing menial labor by force since then. All the stuff they don't want to do, building barricades, running food, corpse removal. I swear, if I had a can of soup for every zombie I've had to drag to a bonfire, I'd have enough food to last until the next damn apocalypse, he sighed heavily. Honestly, though, I had all but accepted my fate. But then I heard about the train. Some of the guards shared nervous glances, and he noticed an ever-so-worried edge to Joshua's gaze. I was clearing off the dishes from breakfast, and I heard a couple of those army boys talking about it. Atticus continued weaving his tail. They were pouting because their rations were going to be cut because someone took their food by force. I thought, well, hell, if there are other people out there willing to stand up against these slave drivers, then I can too. Grabbed a gun out of the armory and hightailed it out of there. And within a matter of hours you stumbled upon our little camp? Joshua asked dryly. Atticus shrugged. Hey, you heard my story. Don't you think it's about time I had a little look? He asked. The other man nodded slightly before leaning over to one of his guards. He spent a good thirty seconds whispering in his ear. Atticus waited patiently, not speaking, just watching as the man nodded before running off. Atticus, was it? Joshua asked, and the cowboy nodded. Very well, Atticus. I'll be honest with you, I'm not entirely sold on your autobiography there. However, I'm hesitant to call it straight-up horseshit, because if I was going to do that, I would have just had my guards shoot you. He paused. You said you needed a place to stay tonight. Is that right? He asked. Yes, sir, it is, Atticus replied politely. Joshua nodded. Very well, he said, and held up a finger. I have conditions, however. Your house, your rules. The cowboy replied with a shrug. You will need to surrender your weapons to my men here. Subject yourself to a pat-down, and you will be confined to your room until morning. 
Joshua said, counting off the items on his fingers. Atticus blinked at him. You're going to throw me in a cell? he asked. Not at all, Joshua replied, holding up a palm. We have a spare room for... guests. Are we in agreement? I get the sense that if I say no, then you're going to shoot me, Atticus drawled. So yes, we are in agreement. Joshua motioned to his men. Go collect his weapons. Two men stepped forward, and Atticus raised his hands, allowing them to unbuckle his holster and confiscate his weapon. They patted him down, finding the nine-millimeter handgun on his back and pulling it out. Once he was disarmed, they brought him back into town. The guards surrounded him like he was a high-value prisoner, marching him through town. Atticus looked around, taking stock of the situation, seeing a lot of women and children in the mix. There were easily upwards of twenty or thirty of them. The guards took them to a large house and opened the door, leading him inside where there were a couple of men sitting in the living room, warming themselves by the fire. They didn't speak or even get up as Atticus moved through the room towards a back hallway, where a door with a padlock stood. One of the guards pulled out a key and unlocked it, opening the door and motioning for the cowboy to enter. Atticus strolled in, turning around to look at Joshua. I'll have my men bring you some food in an hour or so, the leader drawled. Some of the women are cooking some stew for us. Should be pretty tasty. The cowboy nodded, holding his gaze. I look forward to it, he said. The door clicked shut, and the telltale sound of the padlock clicking into place was almost ominous on the other side. He says it's tasty, somebody said from behind him, causing him to jump, startled. But I'd be willing to bet the woman making it is his wife, so he kind of has to say that. Who are you? Atticus demanded, calming his racing heart as he took in the twenty-something man sitting against the far wall. Name's Caleb, he said, running a hand through his sandy blonde hair. And I'm a prisoner, just like you. Chapter 8 Atticus walked back and forth across the room, studying everything as he paced. Caleb watched him for a few moments before speaking up. So, how'd you end up here? he asked casually. Just walked into the wrong neighborhood, Atticus muttered, chewing over his options. He didn't like this, especially given there was another man in the room claiming to be a prisoner just like him. Sounds like what happened to me, Caleb said with a deep sigh. Mm-hmm, Atticus replied noncommittally. He wasn't too interested in talking. His brain was too focused. He walked over to the windows, inspecting them. There wasn't any bars on them, but when he tried to lift it up, he found it nailed shut. Yeah, already tried that, my friend, Caleb said, clucking his tongue. They got it painted or nailed shut or something. Tried everything I could, but it wouldn't budge. He shrugged and flopped down on the bed. So come on, tell me, how'd you find this place? Atticus's brain niggled, noticing the nervous energy surrounding the man so he kept his facade going as he continued to look around the room. I escaped from low-level work for the army in Hayden and set out on my own, he explained. Just got lucky, for lack of a better term, that I found this place. Really? Caleb blurted. You honestly didn't know we, I mean, they were here? Atticus side-glanced him, noticing the flub but not drawing attention to it. Had no clue they were here, he said, shaking his head slowly. Like I said, just lucky, I guess. Not me, man, Caleb said with a shrug. He looked like he was trying to look nonchalant and cool, but it was clear that he was nervous. I heard about how badass these guys were and wanted to be a part. Oh, really? Atticus asked, keeping the sarcasm out of his tone. So they're badasses, huh? Caleb still sounded tense, his hands moving all over as he spoke. Oh, yeah, man. These cats are well known in the area, he said quickly. I wanted to join up with them even before all this went down. I found them just after the dead started to wake up with an appetite. Looks like it did you a lot of good, Atticus said dryly, waving a hand to highlight the confines they found themselves in. Nah, it was really my fault. I got greedy, Caleb gushed, his words coming fast. They welcomed me and let me work at first, but I wanted some extra food, got caught, and this is my punishment. And you just accepted that? The cowboy asked, cocking a brow. Yeah, I have, 
Caleb replied, nodding like a bobblehead. They feed me, and it's not like I can get out of here. Plus, where would I go? I mean, where would you go if you could? He shrugged, sweat breaking out on his brow. Surely you still have some friends in the army? Maybe some friends who tipped you off? Atticus faced the window, hiding a smirk. He knew this guy was a plant to get information from him, but he just wasn't intelligent enough to pull it off. The cowboy contemplated for a moment before an idea blossomed in his mind. He schooled his expression and turned around. All right, I'll level with you, he said as if sharing a secret. Caleb perked up, attentive, barely able to contain his wide-eyed excitement. Yeah? he asked. If Atticus didn't have a better poker face, he would have rolled his eyes. The military doesn't know about this place, but they know somebody is out of here, he said, keeping his voice low. I didn't escape. Rather, I volunteered. They said if I could find the people who raided that train, they'd set me up in a big house with all the food I could eat. He kept a straight face despite the urge of cracking a smile. Technically, he was telling the truth. Now you and I, he motioned between them, as if they were old conspirators. We're going to get out of here right now. We're going to go back to the military, tell them about this place, and then we're going to live like the kings we know we are. Caleb nodded again, too emphatically to be natural. Sure, that sounds great and all, he said. But they got this place locked up tight. He shrugged and slumped his shoulders. The overly dramatic, ah, oh, shucks, laughable. Atticus smirked and knelt down, knocking gently on the old hardwood floors. He ran his finger along the boards, finding them somewhat loose. Great thing about these old houses, they don't always hold up to the years of use, he said. Caleb sat up straight, watching him with a worried expression, though it was clear from his tone he was trying to hide it. Yeah, I mean, I thought about that too, he blathered. But there isn't anything in here to pry those boards with. That's why you have to be prepared for any situation, young man, Atticus said with a flourish, and reached down to his right boot. He used his thumbnail to chip away a string on the heel. When he got a grip of it, he pulled, tearing away a small outline of the heel. Once it was free, a two-inch square popped off, revealing a small compartment containing a knife. Had this situation down near El Paso once, Atticus said conversationally. Not too far off from this one, actually. Caleb swallowed hard. Had a dangerous job, did you? He asked, shrilly. You could say that, the cowboy said. Anyway, this mark I was hunting down got the jump on me. I thought he was going to end me right there, but this genius decided he was going to try to take me hostage, try and use me to get himself out of trouble. So there I sat in a cold, barren room, tied up with my hands in front of me. He motioned with his hands, miming the motions. Only thing I could reach was my boots, and I spent hours thinking to myself how useful a knife would be in that situation. I mean, I did have a boot knife, but being in Texas, it was to be expected, so he grabbed it. He shook his head. Spent thirteen hours tied up, waiting on someone to come rescue me, which they eventually did. Tell me, Caleb, have you ever spent thirteen hours thinking of the exact same thing? His companion opened his mouth, but the cowboy raised a finger to stop him. And I don't mean a woman, Atticus cut in. Caleb closed his mouth and then shook his head. Well, I have, the cowboy continued, flicking the knife around his fingers expertly. And let me tell you, until that thought is dealt with, it haunts you, torments you. So I had these boots made up, uncomfortable as hell, but worth it for the peace of mind they bring. He dug the blade into the loosest board, managing to pry it up just far enough to get his fingers under it. He continued to pull, yanking the plank from its home. He grabbed onto the board next to it and then glanced up at Caleb. Don't just sit there, he snapped. Come give me a hand. Caleb hesitated for a moment, clearly weighing his options, knowing that his instructed plans had gone off the rails. Oh, oh yeah, he stammered, and knelt down to help with the floorboards. So, I mean, there's lots of guys out there. What are we going to do? We're pretty close to the tree line, Atticus replied. Gotta get through one yard and buy another house, and we're home free. Shouldn't be too much trouble to get underneath the house and through the crawl space across to the outside. It's just about supper time, so a lot of them will be distracted. Caleb swallowed hard. What about a gun? he asked, voice strained. I know where the armory is. Where? Atticus asked, wondering if he was dumb enough to tell him the truth. 
Caleb jerked a thumb over his shoulder. Down by the waterfront, he said. There's a house that- It's no good, Atticus cut in, shaking his head. As much as I want my guns back, it's too much of a risk. Besides, all we have to do is get back to the army, and they'll take care of business. Sweat dripped from Caleb's brow and splashed onto one of the boards. But- No buts. We just need to get out of here, the cowboy said firmly, putting a hand on the man's shoulder. I know you're nervous, but you and I, we're going to be living like kings before the sun comes up again. Caleb reluctantly helped him pry up the boards, and soon they had enough of a hole that they could get through to the crawl space below the house. Now, this isn't my first time, so you follow my lead, do exactly what I say, and we'll get out of this okay, Atticus said firmly, and his companion swallowed hard and nodded. At a boy, the cowboy said, clapping him on the shoulder. Come on. He went in first, lowering into the hole, and Caleb shuffled in behind him. Atticus pushed down his hat, making sure it was secure as they began to crawl. After a few moments, they reached the small door that was a yard tall, leading to the outside. Atticus gently pushed on it, but it was locked from the outside. He peered through the crack and saw it was a simple latch hook, so he wedged his knife beneath it, flicking it upwards and freeing the door. He cracked the door open and looked out. The coast was clear from their position to the next house, which was by the trees. He leaned close to Caleb. Okay, when we get out of here, you run faster than you have ever before, he whispered. Got it? he asked. Caleb gave him a half-hearted thumbs up and Atticus led him out of the house, kneeling beside the door to keep a keen eye out. As Caleb shimmied his way out, the cowboy spotted movement at the corner, a man emerging in hunter's gear. Atticus leapt into action, moving like a blur. He delivered a strike to the man's throat, leaving him gasping for air. He pulled the flailing body fully behind the house, spinning him about and getting him into a chokehold. The man struggled for a few moments before passing out. He grabbed the handgun from the unconscious man's holster before glancing over at Caleb, who was white as a sheet. Is he dead? he hissed. He's going to have one hell of a hangover, but he'll be fine. Atticus whispered back as he checked the gun and got it ready for action. Come on, we have to move. He nodded to Caleb and led a sprint to the next house. When they reached the side of it, they took a knee by the front corner. Atticus looked out at a hastily constructed fence consisting of chopped wooden planks, each one a few yards long, as if they'd gotten the inspiration from a Civil War recreation society. There were a couple of patrols at either end of the street, fifty or sixty yards in either direction, both of whom were walking away from them. Atticus didn't hesitate, immediately running across the street, the two of them hopping the fence with ease since it wasn't meant to hold up the living, only the recently deceased. When they made it to the woods they moved quickly, and the only thing on Atticus's mind was getting to where his shotgun was. Hey, hold up, hold up, Caleb huffed. Atticus ignored him though he could hear his footsteps keeping pace. Come on, man, hold up a second, Caleb pleaded. We gotta keep moving, Atticus said. We'll talk later. Excitement sparked when he reached the tree concealing his shotgun. I mean it, man, stop, Caleb hissed, and the unmistakable sound of a handgun hammer cocking clicked in the night air. Atticus stopped fully, turning his head slightly to look over his shoulder at his companion, about ten yards away, holding a gun on him. His hands shook, clearly not up to the task, but a loaded gun was dangerous despite the young man's inexperience. Do we have a problem? Atticus asked dryly. Yeah, we do, Caleb said shakily. I'm going to need you to drop that handgun. Toss it far. The cowboy complied, tossing the gun a few yards to his right, all while keeping his back to the man. Let's talk about this, he said slowly. You don't need to say another word, Caleb shot back. You already told me everything I needed to know. You were going to kill us all by telling the military about us. Us, huh? Atticus drawled, as if it were just dawning on him what the ruse was. Joshua put you up to this. He's not a bad guy once you get to know him, Caleb insisted. If he was, he would have shot you on sight. But he doesn't want needless death. Atticus shook his head slowly. Nor do I, which is why you need to listen to me carefully he said, enunciating each word. Why? Caleb snapped. So you can spin another tall tale about how you work for the military or don't work for the military? Or maybe how you're a circus performer just traveling to his next gig? 
he scoffed. Everything that has come out of your mouth has been bullshit, and I'm done listening to it. Atticus nodded slowly. You're right. You're a hundred percent right, he agreed. I haven't been totally honest with you, or Joshua for that matter, but I'm going to be straight with you right now. Caleb rolled his eyes. Uh-huh, sure, he drawled. If you shoot me, a special forces unit is going to sweep through your little community and wipe out everyone, Atticus said firmly. Bullshit, Caleb scoffed. The U.S. military isn't going to kill women and children. The cowboy shook his head emphatically. You don't understand, he insisted. Food is scarce in Seattle, like there might not be enough to get everybody through the winter kind of scarce. You boys hit a military transport and took food bound for Seattle. They're going to want that back. And the last thing they need are more mouths to feed. He kept his tone urgent and quick, leaving no room for doubt or interruption. Now you let me go, and I tell them the situation has resolved itself. Your community stays hidden and in its own lane, and out of the sights of the army boys with itchy trigger fingers. Caleb snorted. Convenient how the only way to save ourselves is to let you live, he said. How else do you think I found your camp so soon after you robbed a train? Atticus pressed. I have satellite images showing this area. Tracked you down from those. He reached for his back pocket, but Caleb took a step forward, jabbing the gun forward. Don't you move, he warned. Atticus froze. You need to listen to me, he said. I'm done listening, and I'm done letting you endanger me and mine, Caleb snarled. Atticus leapt behind the tree just as he fired. Thankfully, the young man wasn't a very good shot and missed badly, giving the cowboy time to grab his shotgun and come around the other side. Caleb panicked, firing again, hitting the tree as Atticus raised his shotgun and fired, sending a round straight into the militia plant's chest. The impact knocked him right off of his feet, his body slamming into a nearby tree. Atticus racked another shell in and walked over to Caleb, wheezing his last breaths on the ground. He couldn't say anything, though his mouth moved open and shut, staring up at his killer with a terrified gaze. I'm sorry, I really am, Atticus said, but I gave you every chance to listen to me, and I will be damned if I let you or anybody else keep me from seeing my daughter again. Caleb stopped breathing, going limp against the tree. Atticus picked up the handgun before going back into the woods to get the one he'd thrown away. As he got ready, many sets of footsteps echoed in the distance, rushing towards him. Well, looks like my day is not over just quite yet, he muttered to himself. Chapter 9 Atticus ran through the woods back towards his truck, ready to make his escape. He heard some muffled voices behind him, speaking loudly and angrily as they found Caleb. Okay, just get back to the truck and get your ass out of here, he thought frantically. The military can handle it from here. He kept running, but a disturbing thought zinging through his brain. These guys aren't going to go quietly, and the military is going to have to make an example out of them. They know it's a small enough group they can handle, and it's going to be bad. He skidded to a stop about fifty yards from the end of the trees. He could see the parking lot just ahead. If I don't get through to Joshua and convince him, then most of that community is going to die. Probably kids, too. He clenched his jaw and stashed his shotgun, checking the two handguns and shoving one into his back belt and gripping the other one tightly. Plus, I want my guns back, he thought firmly. He pulled out his knife, putting it into his offhand before darting back into the woods and veering hard to the south into the dense brush. These guys are going to be spread out, hopefully only one or two of them at a time, he thought, his brain strategizing as he moved. Wound if you can, kill if you must. He couldn't stop the wave of sadness that momentarily washed over him. He was about to take more lives, and that was difficult. But also he knew that if he didn't, a lot more innocent life would be snuffed out. Atticus ran south quickly, weaving in and out between the trees, putting some distance between him and the men hunting him. He found a slight ridge with a large fallen tree on the ground and hopped over to take cover. He peeked over the top to survey the situation. He spotted two pairs of men about a hundred yards in the distance, branching off from one another and walking diagonally. If they kept walking on their current path, they'd end up about thirty yards on either side of Atticus's position. He looked to his left at an open area within the trees, 
and to his right was a fairly dense area, with lots of smaller trees. Good luck getting an accurate shot off in that mess, he thought, as he moved to the right. This is where I'll hit him. He stayed low, moving quickly towards the ambush point. There were some bigger trees behind smaller ones, and he took a position behind them. He readied his knife and handgun, his knife in striking position. He lay in wait, listening for the two men to come to him. The footsteps grew louder, coming within a few yards of the tree he was behind. The footsteps diverged coming around the tree, and Atticus sprung. He smacked away a hunting rifle and stabbed the man in the chest a couple of times rapidly. He screamed and Atticus spun him around so that his back was to his partner. Let him go! The other man cried, raising his rifle and firing. His bullet hit his partner's shoulder, spinning him to the ground. The impact too hard for Atticus to continue holding him up. The cowboy didn't hesitate, immediately opening fire with his handgun, hitting the hunter three times in the torso and dropping him. The first man moaned in pain, still breathing and writhing on the ground, and then another shot rang out in the darkness, hitting the tree next to him. Atticus looked up at another duo rushing towards him and fired another shot in their direction, to force them behind cover and give him time to do the same. He stayed low, moving from tree to tree as the other two opened fire. Wood splintered and flew in every direction as he moved towards them. The firing stopped for a moment, and the cowboy peeked out from behind cover. The two men crept up towards him, giving him an opportunity to fire. His first shot was dead on, hitting one of the men in the side of the head and killing him instantly. Atticus dodged back behind cover as the other man fired, missing him and the tree entirely. The hunter fired again, hitting high and forcing the cowboy to kneel down. He listened as the man rushed towards him, firing a couple of wild shots in the process. Atticus popped out from behind cover, shooting low several times. He managed to hit the man in his shin, sending him face first into the ground. The hunter screamed in pain, staggering to his feet and wobbling back and forth, woozy from smacking his head into the forest floor. Atticus emerged from cover, smacking the rifle away from his opponent and aiming his handgun at his now unarmed enemy. Where's Joshua? he demanded. The hunter flopped on the ground, writhing and holding his leg. Atticus gave him a kick in the side to get his attention. Where is Joshua? he demanded. The docks! the hunter cried. Where the shops are? Atticus asked. Yeah, the man groaned in pain. How many of you are there? the cowboy asked. I don't know. Ten? The man whimpered, holding his wounded leg. Before Atticus could ask another question, somebody else screamed for help. The cowboy turned at the sound of moans, and a couple of zombies emerged from the trees, shambling towards him, no doubt attracted by the gunfire. He broke from his position running towards the wounded man, the zombies a few yards away and closing quickly. He fired a couple of shots while running, but hitting their heads, but punching one of them in the torso to get his attention. The creature moaned as it came for him, shifting its gait and reaching for the cowboy. Atticus ran full speed ahead, leaping into the air just before reaching the ghoul and planting his knee into its chest. He drove it backwards into the other one that was reaching down towards the screaming wounded hunter. The two beasts tumbled to the ground, and Atticus raised his handgun, popping them both in the face. Thank you, thank you, the hunter stammered. But why? Atticus shook his head. I'm too tired to be running from a runner, he explained. Besides, I'm not trying to kill you people. Could have fooled me, the man hissed. Look where I stabbed you, Atticus snapped. Sure, it hurts like hell, but no vital organs. The wounded hunter looked down at his injuries, realizing that the cowboy was right. He gave a begrudging nod. Atticus looked around for more zombies, not seeing any. He was conflicted, though knowing he couldn't stick around but not wanting to leave his man to the wolves. Can you walk? he finally asked. The hunter shook his head. Probably not far, he admitted. That shot did a number on me. This is gonna hurt like hell, Atticus warned, but I gotta do it. He reached down and picked the hunter up, causing him to scream. He draped his arm around his shoulder, grabbing him by the belt and carrying him over to the other hunter. He set him down and leaned him up against a tree before grabbing the other one and dragging him over, propping him up as well. I'm just trying to help you people, he said firmly. There's a storm coming, but if I can get Joshua to understand, then you can weather it. If not, what I did is nothing compared to what's going to happen. 
The men looked concerned and confused, and still in pain. What's coming? one of them asked hoarsely. The military, Atticus said firmly. Unless I can give them a good reason not to. Now you said Joshua is at the docks with what? Five other men? That true? The one with the leg wound nodded. Yeah, they're going to be ripping that place apart looking for you, he said. Is Joshua an intelligent man? the cowboy asked. Will he listen to reason? The hunter nodded. We were running out of food and were desperate, he explained. He didn't want to hit that train, but we didn't have a choice. Not what I asked, Atticus quipped. The hunter seethed. He'll listen, he said. Good enough for me, Atticus said and got to his feet. If they don't gun me down, I'll tell them where you are. He turned to leave, walking off. Wait, the man cried. What? What if more of those things come? Atticus paused and thought for a moment. He glanced over at the rifle he'd kicked away and then walked over, picking it up. He manually popped out each of the remaining bullets and once the rifle was empty, he tossed it to their feet. I have four bullets in my hand that I'm going to toss to you, he said. I'm going to be out of range by the time you can get one chambered. But just remember that every time you fire, those things hear it. I'm trusting that your survival instinct is stronger than your desire to make me pay for hurting you. We ain't gonna shoot at you, the hunter insisted, especially after what you told us about the military. Okay, Atticus said. Good luck, boys. He tossed the bullets to them and turned tail, darting through the woods. He wove between the trees, his heart rate picking up, both from the exertion and his nervousness over the upcoming confrontation with Joshua. Chapter 10 Atticus stopped at the edge of the woods, looking out to the stores. He saw one pair of men walking the perimeter, looking for him. Neither of them were Joshua. The cowboy continued to scan the area, not seeing the others. He thought to himself, figuring they must be in one of the buildings. All right, here goes nothing, he thought, and then broke from the trees rushing over to the vehicles in the parking lot, staying under cover while getting closer and closer. He leaned around the back of the vehicle, seeing movement inside the general store. That's got to be him, he thought. They said there were six of them up here. I got two outside, and there's at least three moving in that building. Unless Joshua is going so low, which is doubtful. He readied his handgun and knife, waiting for the two on the perimeter to come around again. They walked around the building, giving him a chance to move. Atticus ran straight for the store, and as he grew closer, the front door began to open. He lowered his shoulder, slamming into it, sending the man behind it flying back into the store. The cowboy kept his momentum up as the man's partner panic fired his shotgun, hitting the floor and prompting curses from his partner that he nearly hit. The store was fairly dark and filled with a lot of lake-related goods, fishing gear, jackets and the like, and Atticus ducked behind a tackle box display. Who the hell is firing? Joshua bellowed. It's him! One of the guards cried back. Atticus, nice of you to show up, Joshua drawled, his voice suddenly taking on a conversational tone. Can't say it was the smartest move. Joshua, you need to listen to me, the cowboy called firmly. A few shots popped off in his general direction, and he hit the ground, crawling along the floor as plastic and metal flew everywhere from the displays. Finally, Joshua whistled, causing the shots to stop. How about waiting for a goddamn target before firing, huh, boys? He barked in exasperation. It's not like ammo grows on trees. Now fan out and find him. The three other men in the building moved through the store, spreading out to locate their enemy, while Joshua stayed behind the counter. Atticus slipped inside one of the round display racks with a bunch of branded t-shirts marked down on special. He waited until one of the men came by, being careless and not checking behind the clothes. As soon as his back was turned, Atticus leapt out and delivered a kidney punch, forcing the man to drop his gun. He got him into a chokehold, dragging him back into the display. There was a brief muffled struggle until the man passed out. By the discount rack! Joshua bellowed, and the other two men rushed over, guns at the ready. When they got there and peeked behind the counter, they looked cautiously behind the shirts, but only found their unconscious friend. He's not here, one of them said, confused. Atticus popped up behind Joshua and put the barrel of his gun against the back of the militia leader's head, cocking the hammer back. That's because I'm right here, 
he said menacingly. Joshua sighed and raised his hands. Found him, he said dryly. The two men turned and approached carefully, prompting Atticus to draw his other handgun from the back of his belt and aim it at them. They had their own guns raised as he tried his best to take cover behind their leader. All right, let's take it easy there, boys, Atticus drawled. It's not the best lighting conditions in here, and I've seen the way you shoot. So if triggers are to be pulled, I'd wager that mine would be the only one to find its target. Joshua clucked his tongue. Since I'm the only one guaranteed to take one of those bullets, he said firmly, I tend to agree with our friend here. Go ahead and lower your weapons. No choice but to let this play out. The men hesitated, but ultimately lowered their weapons. Well, you have my attention, Joshua finally said. Say whatever you came here to say, but if you wouldn't mind humoring me, I would love to hear you explain how you think you're getting out of this scenario. It's simple, really, Atticus replied. Either I walk out of here, or everybody in your camp is dead within seventy-two hours. The two hunters shared a terrified look at the threat, but Joshua didn't budge. Atticus chalked it up to the fact that he had a gun pressed against the back of his head, and not wanting to move. But it was also possible the man had an excellent poker face. How do you figure that? Joshua finally asked. The army knows you hit that train, Atticus explained, and they don't care what your reasons are. They sent me out to assess the situation and deal with it if I could. Now, if I were a man lacking a soul, I would have taken note of your meager defenses in isolated location and went back to report that to my people, at which point I would have my feet propped up in my new apartment, eating a well-cooked meal while special forces burned your community to the ground. Joshua shook his head slightly, not jostling the gun, but making his point. My brother was in the military, he said, though there was a slight waver in his voice. They have rules against harming civilians. Sure, before zombies were running around eating people, Atticus agreed. Now, though, they're trying to rebuild in Seattle, and food is tough to come by. What you and your friends did was an act of war in their eyes, and they'll do whatever they have to in order to protect their mission. He took a deep breath to let his words sink in. Now, I've risked my life, multiple times I might add, to give your people a chance. I suggest you take it. Joshua grunted. I'm open to hearing your offer, he admitted. But just know that giving back the food we took isn't going to happen. I would rather face down the military than what we were facing. Which was? Atticus asked. A winter of slowly starving to death, Joshua explained. I didn't make the decision to hit that train lightly but I would do it again if I had to. The cowboy jutted out his chin. Why not just come join up with Seattle, he asked. They're taking people in. Joshua shook his head. We talked about it, but too many people in the camp refused, he explained. Some were used to living off-grid, others were in the military and didn't have the greatest experience with it. So living under military rule isn't exactly high up on their list of things they want to do. Atticus nodded. Yeah, I can understand that, he agreed. So knowing that we're keeping the food, what do you propose? Joshua asked slowly. The cowboy took a deep breath. You're putting me in a tough spot, he admitted. But I believe I can make it work. I'm going to need a few things from you, though. If we can get it for you, then we will, Joshua promised, and his voice left the cowboy no reason to distrust the words. You need to send your men south of where I shot Caleb, Atticus explained. You have two wounded men down there who could use your help. And don't worry, I left them with a weapon to defend themselves against zombies, but they'll need some medical attention. Joshua stiffened. Only two? he asked. Afraid so, Atticus replied slowly. I had to defend myself and two men lost their lives. It wasn't my first choice, just like with Caleb, but at the end of the day, I've got to protect myself. Joshua took a deep breath. I can understand that, he said. Hitting the train ended a man's life as well. We'll just consider this collateral damage. He nodded to his shell-shocked looking men. One of you get the others from outside and go get them. Take them back to camp. Before you go, Atticus said quickly, there are a couple of things I need you to get for me. The man who was about to leave paused, looking to his leader as if asking for permission to take the orders. Joshua nodded, and the man fixed his gaze on the cowboy. When I came into your camp, I had two guns, Atticus said a silver forty-four magnum with a holster, and a nine mil. I would like both of those back. 
The man nodded and turned again, but the cowboy cleared his throat to get his attention. I'm also going to need a pinky finger from each of the three men I killed, he added. The man stopped dead in his tracks, his mouth falling open. The other one simply glared at him, and Joshua turned his head a little bit in shock, even with the gun against the back of his skull. That's gruesome, Joshua pointed out. Yes, it is, Atticus admitted, but also necessary. Might as well grab some sturdy rope while you're down there, too. Do what the man says, Joshua instructed, and hurry. I'm not exactly a fan of having a gun jammed into the back of my head. The guard nodded and ran out the door, barking at the others outside. So, what now? Joshua asked with a sigh. This place got a break room? Atticus asked. Yep, the militia leader replied. I wouldn't be surprised if there were a few snacks stashed in there as well. Atticus nodded and quipped. Well, let's go have a seat and get comfy. Chapter 11 Atticus stood beside his truck, tossing the shotgun and his personal weapons into the cab, all while keeping a handgun trained on Joshua. Make sure he's tied up nice and tight now, Atticus instructed as one of the younger guards tied the militia leader to a chair. Don't want any sneaky moves while I'm trying to drive off. This isn't exactly building trust between us, you know, Joshua said dryly. On the contrary, it's giving me an opportunity to prove that I am a man of my word, the cowboy countered. Joshua wrinkled his nose. How so? he asked. Well, if three days go by and a special forces team doesn't execute you in the middle of the night, you'll know that I kept my word and convinced the military that you were dealt with, Atticus quipped. Fair enough, Joshua muttered. The guard finished tying him up, and the cowboy waved him away. Go on now, get deep into those woods, Atticus instructed. You can come back in twenty minutes, I'll be long gone by then. It's okay, Joshua assured the young guard, do as he says. The man nodded to his leader and gave Atticus a glare full of contempt as he rushed off. Once he was clear of the trees, the cowboy holstered his weapon and walked over to take a knee next to the militia leader so they were eye to eye. Now, I want you to look into my eyes when I tell you this, he said, voice level and clear. I am going to try everything I possibly can to convince the army that you and your people are not a threat. In order for me to do that, however, you are going to have to promise me something. Go on, Joshua replied with a nod. No matter what happens, you cannot attack another train or transport, Atticus said firmly. Do I have your word on that? You do, Joshua replied, his voice tight and convincing. Good, the cowboy replied, swiping his palms together. Now, it seems to me like you boys took a fair amount of food from that train. With as small as your camp is, that food should be good enough to get your people through the winter, assuming you can do some hunting and fishing to supplement it. I believe we'll be able to manage, Joshua agreed with a nod. We have a few greenhouses we are attempting to get growing for us. The train heist will keep us going until then. Good, because I can't stress this enough, Atticus continued, pointing a finger in his face. If you, or anybody in your camp, attacks the military again, no amount of talking on my part will be enough to prevent them from coming down on you like a sledgehammer. You understand? Joshua nodded, and though he didn't look afraid, he had the decency to look resigned. I do, he said. Atticus leaned in, saying it again, slowly and with more menace than before. Do you understand? Joshua took a moment, swallowing, and there was the flicker of fear in his eyes. He nodded. I do, he said solemnly. And you have my word. I can work with that, Atticus said and stood up, staring down at him. Normally, I would be a proper gentleman and shake your hand. But seeing as I had you tied up, that's not going to work. You could untie me, Joshua said with a smirk. Atticus chuckled. Not until I know I can trust you, he said, which, if I can, means our paths will most likely never cross again. If you are a man of your word, then you are welcome where I am any time, Joshua replied, inclining his head. Atticus nodded and got into his truck, starting it up and driving off. He looked in the rearview mirror, staring at the man tied to the chair. A deep sigh of relief exited his chest, and he stared intently at the road ahead. Well... That was a hell of a day, he thought to himself. Now the real fun begins, convincing the army not to make a liar out of me.
Chapter 12 Atticus walked through the stadium, his gun still dangling on his hip, carrying a small bundle in his hand. He tipped his cap to a couple of ladies walking through, and then a soldier noticed him and approached. "'Can I help you, sir?' he asked politely of the towering cowboy. "'I'm looking for Noah,' Atticus replied. The soldier raised his chin. "'Is he expecting you?' he asked. "'Yes, the name's Atticus,' he replied. The soldier clicked on his communicator. "'Noah, I have an Atticus looking to speak with you?' He paused to listen to the reply, and then nodded. Mm "'Mm-hmm. I'll tell him, sir. Thank you.' "'Where am I headed?' Atticus asked, keeping the smugness from his voice. "'The conference planning room,' the soldier replied. "'He said the same one you were in yesterday.' The cowboy nodded. "'I remember it well,' he said. "'Thank you.' The soldier nodded as Atticus headed upstairs, walking down the hallway before finally spotting the room. He didn't knock, just opened the door and waltzed in. When he did, Corporal Gad and Clint looked up from the table where they sat alongside Noah. "'Morning, gentlemen,' Atticus greeted, and flopped into a chair across from them. "'You must be way better than advertised if you're back this early,' Clint said. Gad clucked his tongue. "'Or you failed miserably,' he quipped. Atticus smirked, tossing the bundle onto the table in front of Gad as he removed his hat and set it down next to him. "'Does that look like I failed?' he asked. The three men stared at him confused, and Gad cautiously reached for the little bundle, opening it up. He instantly recoiled at the sight of three pinky fingers. "'What the fuck, man?' he exclaimed. "'You're a psycho!' Clint burst out laughing, shaking his head and pounding a fist against the table. "'This isn't funny, man!' Gad gasped in horror. "'It kind of is,' Clint replied through his mirth, pretending to wipe a tear from his eye. "'I figured you would need proof that I had neutralized the threat,' Atticus explained, crossing his arms. "'Figured this was as good a way as any.' Gad rubbed his forehead. "'Jesus, man. We could have taken your word for it,' he groaned. "'I like to leave nothing up to chance,' the cowboy replied. The corporal gagged a little bit as he took an empty folder and laid it on top of the fingers so he didn't have to see them. Clint got over his original reaction and eyed the cowboy curiously. "'Problem?' Atticus asked, blinking at him. Clint rubbed his chin. "'You don't strike me as the type of man to speak carelessly,' he pointed out. "'Astute observation,' Atticus replied. "'And?' "'You said that the threat has been neutralized, not eliminated.' Clint replied, leaning forward. "'Pretty sure those two words are similar,' Gad put in, still looking a bit green. Clint nodded slowly. "'Similar, yes. But eliminated is a little more definitive. Wouldn't you agree, Atticus?' he asked, cocking a brow. "'I would,' the cowboy agreed. "'Like I said, very astute observation.' "'So the threat is still out there?' Gad demanded, pressing his palms against the table. Atticus shook his head. Like I said, it has been neutralized, he replied. Well, why wasn't it eliminated? Gad asked. Because there are innocents involved, the cowboy replied flatly. Noah cleared his throat. There are innocents involved here too, he said. Exactly, Gad said, motioning to Noah in agreement. They know I mean business, Atticus explained firmly. And they know I'm a man of my word. They're not going to cause you any more trouble. Can you be absolutely certain of that? Clint asked quietly. The cowboy nodded. Like I said, he replied, motioning to the bundle of fingers on the table. I made them a promise about the conditions under which I would return, and they know I'm a man of my word. Question is, Clint, are you a man of your word? The man in question smirked and got up, walking over to his beat-up leather bag, digging around inside and pulling out a laminated pass bearing Atticus's name, with a handful of ration certificates. "'As promised,' he said, holding them out. "'This pass will allow you free entry and exit within the safe zone. There are precious few of these floating around, so if some low-ranking soldier gives you any shit about it, just drop my name.' Atticus took them, staring down, and then flipped through the rations, realizing there were more there than promised. "'Looks like you miscounted here,' he said, leaving the unspoken question hanging in the air between them. "'Nope, that's the correct amount.' Clint replied, crossing his arms. Just consider it a gesture of goodwill, and if you're open to being hired, might have a few more of those for you. Atticus nodded slowly. 
I think we can come to an understanding, he said. As long as it's another day, I'm ready to go see my new place and my girl. Clint glanced at his watch. Just as well, he said. We have a meeting we have to get to with General Stevens. Gad got to his feet. If you don't mind, I'll have someone escort you to your place, he said. That will be just fine, Atticus replied, and shook everyone's hands before they all exited the room. Excuse me, Private Quinn, Gad called, and the pretty blonde soldier from that morning turned from her post in the hallway. Yes, sir, she asked politely. Can you please escort Atticus here to his new place? Gad asked, scribbling on a piece of paper and handing it over to her. Here's the information, just across the way. She looked at the paper and then up at Atticus, a smile spreading on her face with recognition. It would be my pleasure, sir, she said. The trio of important men walked off, leaving the private and the cowboy alone. So, it seems like you've become quite the celebrity around here, she said, amused. Things working out? He held up a fistful of rations. How about I buy a pretty girl breakfast and I'll tell you all about it? He asked, grinning a thousand-watt smile. She blushed and smiled, nodding in agreement. An hour later the two of them strolled down the hallway towards his apartment, carrying cups of coffee from their meal. That sounds like quite the story, Quinn said, shaking her head. You have experiences like that often? Been a lot more frequent these days, Atticus admitted. She laughed. Sounds a lot more exciting than the paperwork I get to deal with, she said. Don't get me wrong, there are days when paperwork sounds amazing, Atticus said, holding up a hand. They shared a chuckle, and Quinn stopped them outside of a door. This would appear to be you, she said, motioning. Thank you for the escort, Atticus said politely, tipping his hat to her. She blushed again and curled a flyaway strand of hair behind her ear. Thank you for the breakfast, she replied, and the lively conversation. Maybe I'll see you around this week? Maybe you will, he said, and smirked as her cheeks went even redder. He winked and then opened the door, slipping inside. Hello, he called. Daddy! Susie's shriek was near deafening, and she came running towards the door. Atticus leaned down and scooped her up into his arms, walking into the main living area as she peppered him with kisses all over his face. The lights were on and cartoons ran on the television, and it was almost surreal to see such a sight. Been a minute since I've seen that, he said. I think Susie likes it, Evelyn quipped from the couch. She hasn't moved from in front of the TV ever since we got here. Hopefully she hasn't driven you crazy, Atticus joked, poking his daughter in the ribs. Evelyn shook her head emphatically. Not at all, she assured him. Noah provided us with a healthy supply of DVDs. Don't think we've watched the same thing twice yet. Is that so? Atticus asked. Susie jumped down from his arms and did a pirouette. It is, she declared. Well, why don't you go pick us out something to watch, and I'll be over in just a few minutes, he asked, giving her head an affectionate pat. Okay, she shrieked, running off to dig through the DVDs. Evelyn approached and led him into the kitchen. Everything go okay? she asked quietly. He nodded. Rough day, but I'm good, he replied with a smile. Good enough to keep this place? she asked hopefully. Better, he replied with a grin and held up the wad of ration slips, tossing them on the counter. Her eyes widened as she looked at them, and then picked up a few. If it's okay with you, I'll go down and get something to cook for dinner, she said. We have a fridge and a microwave, so we can keep leftovers. I'll make something big. Anything in particular you'd like? Whatever you feel like making, he assured her. And honestly, it's probably not up to either of us. Pick out the best of whatever they have, and I'm sure it will be fantastic. She smiled and nodded, heading towards the door. I'll be back soon, she said. Atticus held up a hand to stop her before she left. Evelyn, he said, his voice thickening a bit with emotion. Thank you. I couldn't do this without you. And I wouldn't be alive without you, she replied easily. Now go hang out with Susie. I'll be right back, she smiled, and then headed out. Atticus let out a deep breath and then slid onto the couch draping a massive arm around his daughter. She instinctively curled against him, though her eyes were still mesmerized by the TV. What are we watching? he asked. Cartoons, she replied simply, and rested her head on his chest. He kissed the top of her head. I'm good with that, he replied softly, 
and put his feet up on the coffee table. For the first time since the end of the world, something felt normal. The End Up next, desperate measures are taken to get supplies for the community in Seattle Rebuild Part 6.